Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg said that censoring COVID misinformation posed a challenge to the company, citing the scientific community's frequent errors about the novel virus. He elaborated on this last Wednesday on Lex Friedman's podcast. Let's watch. You just take some of the stuff around COVID earlier on in the pandemic, where um, there were you know, real health implications, but there hadn't been time to fully vet a bunch of the scientific assumptions. And, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of the kind of establishment on that, um, you know, kind of waffled on a bunch of facts and, you know, asked for a bunch of things to be censored that in retrospect ended up being, you know, more debatable or, or true. And that stuff is really tough, right? And really undermines trust. The Facebook founder also said that pinpointing misinformation was, quote, tricky. Journalist Glenn Greenwald weighed in on Zuckerberg's explanation, tweeting Thursday, quote, This is very important. Zuckerberg says that many of the claims about COVID that the U.S. government and the Fauci complex pressured Facebook to censor on the grounds that it was disinformation turned out, in fact, to be very debatable, if not proven true. So this was an interesting exchange, and, and the clip there was a real highlight. Um, Zuckerberg saying, admitting, I mean, it is edifying to hear him admit what so much of us know to be true, which is that uh, the so-called experts, the government health bureaucrat advisor people uh, made a lot of bold claims, and then there was moderation based on that. And we now know there it, it should have been perfectly permissible to have more of a debate around some of those topics. Um, I did watch this whole section where he talks to uh, Friedman about censorship. I didn't watch the entire podcast. It was so long. Who has the time? <laughs> Thank you, viewers out there who watch uh, the, the, how, however many hours of this show we produce on a day. I don't know how you do it. Um, I, I was not. Uh, I was not reassured by some of the things Zuckerberg was saying. Uh, Friedman kind of asked him to react to the Twitter file specifically and say, "Look, you know, we saw all this pressure." And Zuckerberg takes the question uh, in this way and, and kind of says, "Well, don't be too alarmed because." We, the social media companies face so much pressure coming in so many different directions. And th this is true. But he, he was like trying, that was supposed to be reassuring. Like, you can't, if you're worried we're too biased, we're too trying to help He's some cause or another. It can't be that ideological because it's coming, it's coming in every in direction. Which doesn't, which for those of us who have an ideology of, I don't want social media companies to face this pressure, that's not reassuring at all. It, it, you know, if from, from a partisan Democrat or partisan Republican perspective, basically what he's saying is we can't give those people too much they want because the other people want the other thing and then government agencies are different and then in Europe it's totally different and then there's activist groups and then there's the media and it's it's just such a mess that we feel all these... You would also feel frustrated if the ideology of Facebook happened to be, say, liberal-leaning and they right. weren't facing any pressure from conservative or libertarians to right. moderate differently. I mean... There, is there something to what he's saying about there being a checks and balances system where there's dangers to leave them to their own devices from all the headwinds coming from one direction or from all the headwinds coming from the other direction? And that may be... I mean, I think, I think the result is something very bad or <laughs> very, very unstable, unhealthy, unfair. I mean, we, you know, we've talked about, to some extent, probably Trump got preferential treatment because the political costs of taking him down or punishing him for things other users might have been punished for would have been just an eruption of, of disgust and contempt from uh, Republicans because they care specifically about how Trump is, is treated. But that didn't, but just being mad about that didn't stop the platforms from having, you know, bias in a lot of other directions or just like having a knee jerk responsiveness to law enforcement. Anyway, it was interesting. I was not reassured yeah. by, by that part of it. Uh, it is true. They face all these pressures coming in all these different ways. And I, I think people should appreciate that more that, that, you know, there's just as many people in, in political office in, in U.S. Congress and the Senate. There's just as many people saying, you have to take down way more content as there is saying you have to take down a lot less content. Um, but probably overall, when you throw in the media and you throw in European regulators and you throw in all sorts of activist groups, uh, it, it is a lot of pressure to take down yeah, look, to I, end discussions I before thought, their I time. thought this was a good clip, and it was, it was nice to hear Zuckerberg kind of engaging with these sorts of things. What was interesting to me was how like virulently angry some of the reaction was to Zuckerberg. Angry in what way? They were like, well, we've been telling you forever, and, and how dare you acknowledge that we're right? It's too little, too late, like that that kind of energy, which I, throughout this, and you, you have been largely in agreement about this, that there are enemies that keep getting picked out by the kind of free speech mm -hmm. 
Uh, and everyone, we all are very committed to free speech and might even describe myself as a free speech absolutist, but there are those who have very much made it their whole online political ideology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. And they have picked out um, uh, certain bad actors that they see, um, like Joel Roth at Twitter, who, when you actually look at the documents, was doing a lot yeah. of the pushback against the efforts to control their moderation at that company. And Zuckerberg as well, I think the heads of these organizations come under scrutiny for obvious reasons, but also they were similarly being misled by the CDC and these other organizations. And so, I mean, it's easy for us to armchair quarterback and sit here and say, well, I never believed that anyway. But there were a lot of things that I was skeptical about during COVID that I felt uncomfortable going online and talking about because I, I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. My skepticism, my personal choices for myself should not translate into a public health mandate even if I am distrustful of the broader public health mandate. Because at the end of the day, as, right. as wrong as the CDC can be, they are more likely to be more right than me sitting in my you know, apartment having thoughts and feelings about COVID. So I do think it's perfectly fair to be frustrated by people and want accountability from the people that were misled. And to the extent that they should have known better and didn't act accordingly, they deserve all the criticism in the world. But to the extent that they were all in a very fast pace, changing scientific context, trying to do the right thing and being told by what's supposed to be an impartial government organization, which with a lot of resources and public health mandates at its disposal, you know, I, I can't be that mad at folks, especially when they're willing to come forward at this point and say the difficult and true thing, at least difficult to say in a liberal sphere, which is that they got it so wrong and that they've reevaluated their practices now going forward as a consequence of of witnessing firsthand how wrong the CDC was about some aspects of the COVID response. Right, and this is the domain of pure speech, right? It's one thing to criticize um, what they recommended or what you know what policies they thought were good or or um, or claims the, C the CDC and other health officials made about well, you know, if everybody gets vaccinated, then we'll have herd immunity, or then we'll you know it's important to do it to keep cases down, things like that that didn't pan out, um, or even, you know, even requirements, mass mandates, lockdowns, whatever, that's policy. We're, this, is, this, was the, this is the domain of speech, which should be so, um, should be so core to our being as a country mm. that we, the bar for censorship to be okay is higher than anywhere else in the world. Well, let me ask and, you that. And, and, and the, idea that, uh, the idea we didn't have more pushback to the idea that even if it's wrong, yeah. you ought to be able to say it because... We don't know, man. We can't trust someone to just say, no, that's right, that's wrong. You don't get to say if it's yeah. wrong. How many times does that work out where those people don't know or they have some other interest? And that was another example of that. Yeah, it, it, it is really interesting. I remember at the time there were these kinds of stories about people you know, posting during the baby formula uh, mm -hmm. debacle, posting home remedies for baby food and the question about whether or not, you know, if, if there's a recipe right. on the Internet that can cause a baby to die, what is... What is the obligation to step in? Are we saying that the interest in free speech is more important than the interest in some like uncontroversial, uncontroversially damaging health advice to be given? You know, how uncontroversial does the health advice have to be? Right. And that was the issue with COVID. Although, but they used that, man, even on the, the health formula, they, uh, Elizabeth Nolan Brown, who's been on our show a couple times, she wrote about how Facebook, uh, in consultation with the CDC, was taking down recipes for baby formula that were not actually, that were not yeah, harmful I mean, at it, all. Exactly. Um, but they were, you know, not approved so, by the government. So is what bureaucrats. we're saying that ultimately, and 100% of the cases, it should be a laissez-faire situation, or can we contemplate a world in which something is so uncontroversial mm -hmm. and also so damaging that it would be justified to have a moderation intervention? Right. I mean, the argument for free speech is that you get, is, is not that tr lies will never win out or be printed or appear, but that on net or on average, it's better for society to do it that way so that you yeah. don't artificially. And, um, I, and I do think like the, the public comments and yeah. notices and things like that are a lot better at, at, at sure. splitting the baby on that one, but maybe that poor metaphor. <laughs> Let's know. not split, no splitting, no splitting babies <laughs> on social media or anywhere else. More rising right after this.